Imagine our planet without its people. Imagine that every single human being has simply disappeared. This isn't the story of how that might happen. It's the story of what happens to the world we leave behind. Now, in Life After People, what will be the fate of civilization's most precious achievements? Enshrined, encased and buried, they're protected from the outside world, at least for now. One site guards precious sources of life in a crypt dubbed the Doomsday Vault. Another mysterious cavern conceals priceless expressions from a prehistoric time. Can these treasures be protected for eternity, or are they doomed to follow the fate of man? Step into the future of our world's once crowded cities, and visit a town where the future has already happened. Welcome to Earth. Population zero. One day after people. The Declaration of Independence is housed in the West Wing of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Of the 200 copies printed on the 4th of July, 1776, just 25 survive. This one, prized because it was the first to be read aloud in public, is now virtually entombed. The Declaration of Independence is protected in this ever-increasing Russian nesting doll. It's contained within an oxygen-free environment inside a, a climate-controlled case, inside a climate-controlled room, inside a climate-controlled building. Without power, humidity will creep into the case and threaten the document. But unlike today's paper, made of cellulose from trees, 18th century paper has natural cotton and linen fibers that make it stronger. I think linen rag paper, if it wasn't subjected to any environmental forces like light, moisture, or heat, would last thousands of years. Just across the street is the bell that hung above the room where the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, the Liberty Bell, still heavily protected by two thick marble walls. The design of the walls is a heavily guarded secret, but they've been engineered to withstand extreme shock. Well, they're a beautiful, soft, polished marble, but ultimately, the strength and thickness of that material is to provide bomb protection. Almost 4,000 miles away at the Louvre Museum in Paris, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa faces its own risk from within. Painted on wood, it can swell and shrink. The painting is protected by an airtight case that can withstand a rocket-propelled grenade. Sensors in the case can detect the tiniest swelling in the wood. The sensors can actually sense a one micron expansion or contraction. We're talking about one one hundredth the width of a typical human hair. This treasure with the famous smile is buried under layers of protection. But how long will they last? While some icons have been left buried, others are left bound. San Francisco's cable cars are out of service. In the time of humans, they were pulled up and down some of the world's steepest urban hills by a wire cable. This is the sheave room. As they turn, they move the cable at 9.5 miles an hour. The cable cars grab onto the cable as they move. One day after people, the pulleys stop. 
the world-famous cable cars are frozen in their tracks. Hanging by a wire thread, for now. Arching across the water, two bridges, the Golden Gate and the San Francisco-Oakland Bay, are strangely silent. In the time of humans, the Golden Gate was an engineering marvel, crossed by 108,000 cars every day. But two days after people, the only thing crossing the bridge is a single, silent assassin. San Francisco's greatest landmark will die by fog. The moisture that's in the fog itself, condensing on the bridge, will promote the formation of rust. So in a very real sense, the fog may steal in on little cat feet, but when it comes to a steel structure, it's a tiger. To the east, the Bay Bridge stretches more than four miles connecting San Francisco to Oakland. No single bridge could span that distance. So in 1933, engineers solved the problem by building a series of bridges. A causeway section, a cantilever in the middle, and a double suspension design for the deepest part over the shipping channel. The Bay Bridge is a bit of a mongrel or a mutt, but in a good sense. After a section of it collapsed in a 1989 earthquake, the bridge was retrofitted with new bolts, plates, and steel. Sturdier than ever, two days after humans, its only traffic is dust, and that will bring its own challenges. The only sounds to be heard on the waterfront are wavelets lapping at the hull of a cargo ship. Despite the explosion of technology in the time of humans, ships were tied to the pier with the same piece of equipment used by ancient mariners. Ropes hold a ship to the pier. Two days after people, eight ropes made of a synthetic as strong as wire secure the vessel to the deserted pier. A single line can hold fast 55 tons. But for how long? That remains to be seen. It's one week after people. The Petronas Towers soar over the deserted city of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. They're the world's tallest twin buildings, connected by the highest sky bridge ever built. It sits about 400 feet or so in the air, bridging across between the 41st and the 42nd floors. Quite a unique feature. In two separate attempts, human Spider-Man Alain Robert tried to scale one of the 1,483-foot towers with his bare hands. Both times, he climbed 60 floors before allowing himself to be apprehended. Now, only the sun climbs its walls. Amid the remains of civilization, there are survivors. In North America, the pungent smell of old food left in kitchens attracts all sorts of hungry animals. Fourteen days after people, some of the 400,000 wolves living in the wilds invade homes for an easy meal. While the wolves are moving in, dogs are trying to move out. But these animals remain bound to humans. We started manipulating the genetic makeup and the characteristics of other animals long before we had agriculture. Neoteny, the tendency of retaining childlike characteristics, is something that we kept emphasizing in dogs. That's why dogs accept our authority without challenging it. Dogs aren't even good at little tasks like getting out of the house. 
they couldn't break a window, they couldn't, they've been taught not to tear up things and so forth, and most of them would just sit there and starve to death. But one kind of canine would be ideally suited to this new world, the stray dog. Belonging to no one, they live on the outskirts of towns and are lean survival machines. They weigh about 20 pounds, and they're designed to operate really cheaply. They can eat the worst, awfulest food in the world. They've been doing it for thousands of years and so on. They can get by with just a little. For the first few months after people, large populations of stray dogs live, eat, and battle for the mountains of food at landfills and dumps. After that, survival becomes a riskier proposition. It's three months into a life after people. The breathtaking prehistoric paintings and engravings in the Lascaux caves in southern France, thought to be drawn by Cro-Magnon man 30,000 years ago, were discovered in 1940. The quality of them, the dynamism, is just astounding. It is among the most beautiful art ever produced by mankind. Undisturbed again, they could survive for thousands more years, so long as they stay buried. But for how long will the other treasures of our civilization remain secure? When will others come unbound? And what will happen to a site called the Doomsday Vault? Four months after people. In the frozen wastes of Norway's most northerly islands, a doorway in the snow leads to a mysterious crypt. Known as the Doomsday Vault, it was meant to secure the world against a disaster that is now happening in a life after people. That disaster was sparked in the time of humans by the need to feed an exploding population. Agricultural companies engineered seeds to produce super crops and maximize output. Huge tracts of farmland were planted with the single best variety of seed. But this sacrificed a crop's strongest protection from pests, diversity. The diversity that allowed farmers in the 17 and 1800s to establish agriculture in the United States is largely gone. Probably 95% of the corn varieties and wheat varieties that existed back in the 1800s, gone forever. If a single pest or disease comes along and likes the first plant, it's gonna like all the rest of them. So domesticated crops just don't last for very long. In the time of humans, farmers protected their crops with pesticides. Four months after people, there's nothing to stop a single species of insect from mowing down hundreds of thousands of acres. The vault in Norway, called the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, was built for precisely this kind of doomsday plague. With a capacity to store a billion seeds and millions of different kinds, it can bring life back to Earth. If something really were to go wrong in this world, an asteroid hitting the Earth or a global nuclear war, then this seed vault does contain seeds which we would use to restore agriculture in the world. In the time of humans, an artificial cooling system chilled the vault to minus four degrees, perfect for seed storage. Since the electricity failed, the vault has been warming up. It will stabilize at 25 degrees, the temperature of the surrounding permafrost. But how long can the seeds now survive? Two years after people. 
A cable car in San Francisco is about to become gravity's bullet train. The inner core of the cables that run beneath the streets is made of plain rope. After two years, it has rotted away. The car has broken free and become an eight-ton missile of wood and steel. The thing it's most likely to run into first is a vehicle blocking its way. And at that speed, a cable car would slice right through it. Across the bay, eight high-strength lines have held the massive cargo ship fast for two years. Those ropes hold the ship rather loosely. That allows the ship to rise and fall with the tide. In San Francisco Bay, that rise and fall is about six feet. In a howling gale, the rope will be put to the ultimate test. You're talking about uh, ropes that can withstand something on the order of 50, 75 ton pull. But a ship might weigh uh, 50,000 tons. 50,000 tons rocked by wind and waves generates tremendous stress. And a line snaps. Once a first line snaps, the others swiftly follow, and the ship sets a course for disaster. A ship breaking free of its moorings, particularly in a gale, is going to be propelled from the south uh, north toward the Oakland Bay Bridge. Uh, what you're going to have uh, is a very large object hitting another very large object. And if the central part of the hull is hit, it's going to take on water, it's going to be heavier, while the two ends of the ship are more buoyant. That can actually snap the ship in two. Ten years after people, the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia is exposed to an enemy far worse than the British Redcoats. The windows of Independence Hall's west wing were covered with panels to keep out the caustic rays of sunlight. Ultraviolet light excites the molecules within the paper and causes their deterioration much more quickly. The infrared, or slower frequency, produces radiant heat, which will dry out the paper and also increase the speed with which it deteriorates. So light is really the biggest enemy. The failure of a single window pane is all that's necessary to put the declaration in harm's way. A small rock or a piece of another building perhaps that's failed or a branch will be blown by the wind right through that glass. Once the failure starts, it accelerates. With nothing to stop it, the wind makes quick work of the panels. Daylight streams into the building. The words of the declaration are beginning to disappear. Across the Atlantic Ocean, something mysterious is starting to happen to a priceless treasure. The prehistoric art in the Lascaux Caves is decaying. The cave's walls are flaking. How could caves that survived 30,000 years now be fading so fast? The answer is that this is not the original cave. The original was damaged by the effects of too many visitors, so the French built an exact replica for tourists in 1983 and called it Lascaux II. It was made in an old quarry very close to the original cave, and it was a very, very fine piece of work for its time. But now, just 10 years after people, its steel and plaster construction is falling apart. would be disintegrating quite markedly. There is certainly no hope whatsoever, I think, of Lascaux II surviving. 
Just the opposite is happening to the original cave. Without the body heat and daily disturbances of people, the caves that were dubbed the Sistine Chapel of the Ice Age have returned to a natural balance. I think they would survive very happily for another 25, 30,000 years. It will be very, very nice just sitting in the darkness. What was created by prehistoric man will far outlast the recreation built by modern man. The Ice Age paintings will endure because of their underground vault. But for one small American town that is already 25 years into a life after people, it was an underground disaster that brought about its demise. Twenty-five years after people. In a windswept park, an engraved stone marks a mysterious vault. It appears to refer to a town, and yet, there's almost nothing there. Battered signs mark streets and regulate parking, but there are no cars. Graveyard walls are in disarray. Streets are paved and lined with curbs, yet there are no structures except for the occasional house. A nearby road is bizarrely buckled, as if seized by a strange force of nature. This indeed was once a thriving town called Centralia. But what happened? There's no physical trace left of the people except the curbs, the sidewalks, the occasional street sign. It's just a very odd place in many ways. In 1983, Centralia hummed with more than a thousand residents. Businesses, churches, and a school anchored the village. Highway 61 was its main street. Centralia was just a classic small town where everybody knew each other. But something was terribly wrong. Located in the heart of Pennsylvania's coal country, Centralia had always lived by mining. Now, it was about to die from it. Anthracite is what they call hard coal. It burns very hot, and it can burn for a long time. For more than 20 years, a hellish underground fire had been burning in a maze of abandoned coal shafts that ran directly beneath the town. Deadly gases seeped into the homes above the fires, leaving residents little choice but to leave. Well, the mine fire created three dangerous gases and they can all asphyxiate you. Carbon monoxide is the one that people feared the most. In 1984, the federal government bought up hundreds of homes and a mass exodus began. But a handful of residents refused to leave. In many abandoned towns, the first job for nature is to tear down the structures left behind. In Centralia, man gave nature a head start. Almost all the buildings were demolished, and nature was left to take over. 25 years later, vines grow over a rusting trailer home. Inside, the debris-strewn floors are chewed away by moisture. Plastic Christmas ornaments have largely withstood the assault of snow and rain, but their holiday dazzle is faded. Stone walls are surrendering to gravity. Trees, grass, and shrubs have seized the opportunity presented by empty spaces, leaving just a few relics of the human past still visible. You know, you had these sidewalks and curbs that obviously served the neighborhood at, at one point, but there were no houses left. The subterranean inferno burned beneath a stretch of the main highway at the edge of the old town. Ominous cracks erupted in the road and forced the state to reroute it. 25 years later, the fire has torn a huge fissure in the old road. Sulfurous smoke and steam still rises up. Moss grows in the warm vent, sheltered from the bitter winters. The roadway has grotesquely buckled from the underground cave-ins caused by the blaze. 
A hundred yards up the road, where both humans and fire have moved on, thick trees grow in the middle of the abandoned pavement. Cobwebs and dust cover the last abandoned house in the town, its destruction imminent. The basement is an underworld, strewn with the remnants of a family's possessions. The windows offer a haunting view of nowhere. Centralia is the ultimate ghost town. This is the intersection of Locust Avenue and Wood Street, and at one time it was filled with houses. You see an overgrown area now. Nature is reclaiming it since the Centralia relocation took place, and only one house remains today. On the outskirts of town, pipes that were thrust into the ground in an attempt to vent the fire's lethal gases lie rusted and overgrown. The iron gates of the cemetery close to where the fire first broke out have oxidized over the years. The wooden roof of a warehouse down the road is riddled with rot and no longer provides any shelter. But the cinder block walls will stand for several more decades until the mortar crumbles and the bricks collapse. Beneath it all, largely unseen, the fire quietly rages underground. It will continue to burn for another 250 years, long after Centralia is gone. The most enduring part of the story is indeed the power of nature. People can be resilient, they can hang on in the face of conditions that other people think are crazy, but ultimately in the end, you know, nature wins. There's one final legacy, also underground. Marked by the engraved stone in what was once the center of the town, it's a time capsule. Buried nearly 50 years ago, it's due to be unearthed in 2016. Its contents may be the last mystery before the land returns to wilderness forever. It's 50 years after people. In the frozen land of Norway, plant life is beginning to perish in a structure that was meant to preserve it. The first seeds have begun to die in the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. The seed that's going to last the shortest amount of time is a um, seed such as sunflower or lettuce, and maybe that's 50 to 75 years under these conditions. Scientists believe that seeds have a special anti-aging protein. When that protein fails, the seeds die. A bit like corroded rebar in a concrete column, it causes a structural breakdown in the seed. In the cold, dark stillness of the vault, it may well be the collapse of these proteins that makes lettuce seeds the first casualty. Seventy-five years of steamy tropical heat have corroded a part of the Patronus Towers where steel is vital, the supports under the Sky Bridge. The Sky Bridge is constructed primarily in steel, and steel is vulnerable to natural decay. The corrosion buckles a supporting leg, turning the Sky Bridge into a one-way lift. The twin towers made of super strength columns remain intact, but their connection to each other is severed forever. Thousands of miles away in Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell is about to ring one last time. Made of bronze, it can last thousands of years, but the structural integrity is threatened by its large crack and a much less visible one that could be just as damaging. You can actually see that the crack itself, the hairline, extends all the way up 
pass the inscription to the crown of the bell. And that's the bell's greatest weakness. It's the wooden support that holds the bell where the final split will begin. Made from elm, 75 years of moisture and insects have left it too weak to hold the weight of the one-ton bell. Though split in two, the symbol of freedom remains clearly recognizable. A kind of freedom has become the very essence of stray dogs. Once dependent on human leftovers on the streets, they've evolved back into the wild predators they were before domestication. There are places in the world where they've already evolved back into a wild animal. So the village dog in Australia has become something called a dingo. Dingoes were brought to Australia around 2000 BC as domesticated dogs. Released into the outback, they soon numbered hundreds of thousands. And they're doing perfectly well in the wild. But without humans who provided most of their food, stray dogs have seen their population decimated. Where once there were more than 300 million, there are now just a few million. Yet as a species, they will survive because of a unique running ability that distinguishes them from every other creature in the animal kingdom. The cheetah is supposed to be the fastest animal in the world, but they only go three, 400 yards, and then they become exhausted quickly, where a good dog can do miles and miles and miles. And there's no other animal out there in the world that can do that. I think they might make it really successfully. One hundred years after people, the crucible steel of the mighty Golden Gate Bridge has been humbled by common oxygen. What you're talking about is a bridge that is painted rust red now. Years from now, it's going to be rust rust. It may very well be the same color, but when you get close, it's not going to be a healthy place. Dense fogs feed the rust, which threatens at the point of highest stress the vertical cables that bear the crushing weight of the deck. The roadway is not designed to support itself. It's really designed to be suspended from these cables. The failure of one cable quickly triggers others around it. Unsupported, the roadway plunges 245 feet into the chill gray waters of the bay. Only a few miles to the east, the Bay Bridge is in a drier and warmer location. This slows rust, but the moisture triggers another kind of growth. It will actually look a bit like a forest. There'll be a lot of trees growing on it, there'll be a lot of vegetation growing on it. Without maintenance to clear the fledgling forest, dirt clogs the expansion joints. With no room for movement, one span's fate is sealed. Inside the Louvre, the protective case entombing the Mona Lisa was built to withstand a terrorist attack. But humble dust will infiltrate the neoprene seals, forging a path for moisture. The tiniest crack, the tiniest hole anywhere in that case, you're going to have moisture come in there very, very easily. So what happens is that the case itself actually becomes the Mona Lisa's enemy. The dampness sounds a death knell for the painting as it creates the perfect habitat for a tiny insect called the Death Watch Beetle. They got the name Death Watch Beetles during the Middle Ages when people were waiting out the death of a loved one. The house would be very quiet and still because people were waiting for death to arrive. And during that time of silence, they would hear this ticking sound, this tapping sound coming from the walls. And that was being made by the beetles. It's basically a very slight, hardly audible. In fact, the beetles have nothing to do with dying, usually. But the Mona Lisa is painted on wood, 
And these are wood-eating beetles. Perhaps for dessert, the men want to save the smile to the last. The Mona Lisa's fate is just the beginning of civilization's demise. Soon, the fate of an entire city will be sealed. It's now 200 years after people. Only the skeletal specter of the Golden Gate's soaring towers remain. But by the shallows of the Bay Bridge, enough debris has built up around the piers to form a more permanent passage. It will create land by creating an obstruction so that natural silt flows in the bay will actually start piling up against this mess. It will become almost like an island or peninsula all by itself. Three hundred years after people, rain has spawned a new occupying force in historic Philadelphia, a dense forest. Amid the trees, the two blast walls rise out of the earth and surround the half-buried Liberty Bell. Well, it looked very sort of tomb-like, very crypt-like. As the forest buries the bell, the inscription may be one of the last visible pieces. A hundred yards away, the Declaration of Independence lies among the rubble of the West Wing, still intact in its bulletproof casing. The case, built to withstand the blow of a sledgehammer, has shielded the document since the year 2000. But heat and light have left the linen rag paper brittle and desiccated. Three centuries after people, the first blast of air to penetrate through a worn seam of the case will cause the document to disintegrate. Five hundred years after people, the Patronus Towers may be the tallest man-made structures still standing on Earth, thanks to an extraordinary quirk in their design. They were the tallest buildings in the world to be supported by a frame of concrete. Most skyscrapers around the world are steel framed, but Malaysia doesn't have an indigenous steel industry. So these are unique. Five centuries of exposure to tropical sun and torrid humidity have weakened the super strength cement. The collapse begins where the columns are at their most narrow at the top. Cascading debris from one tower triggers the collapse of the other. In seconds, the monumental structures are reduced to dust and rubble. You have a progressive effect where both towers collapsed in a crashing heap to the ground pretty much at the same time. It's only a matter of years before walls of jungle entomb every trace of the once mighty buildings. Two thousand years after people, the Mona Lisa is long gone. But there was also another famous woman in the Louvre, Venus de Milo. The six-foot statue was buried for nearly two millennia before she was unearthed in 1820 by a farmer. Now she is being slowly reburied. Sculpted from marble, the ancient goddess of love was built to last. Just across the river from where the Louvre once stood, the medieval cathedral of Notre Dame also remains. Built entirely of stone, it's held together by the eternal force of gravity. The basic structure of Notre Dame, especially the two towers, will still be standing and still recognizable 
2,000 years from now. Twenty thousand years after people, the last of the hundreds of millions of seeds stored in the global seed vault have died. Their potential to generate new life is gone forever. For the contents of this vault, doomsday has arrived. Ten million years after people. Could the remains of the once great city of San Francisco be fossilized like the bones of the dinosaurs? For fossilization to occur, buildings, like bones, need to be buried before they erode away. Their fate is decided by whether large sections of the Earth's crust on which they sit are pushing the ground up or down. In regions where the Earth's crust is slowly rising, the surface erodes, wiping away the remains of human civilization. But where parts of the crust are moving downwards, under the sea or into the Earth, remains are buried and the forces of fossilization can begin. In the time of humans, San Francisco was perched along the San Andreas Fault, which marked the boundary of two large tectonic plates. This spot on Earth once triggered punishing earthquakes. Now, in the extreme slow motion of geologic movement, it has delivered the ultimate blow. The piece of crust we're on at the moment around San Francisco has little chance. Uh, the landscape here is going up, and if the crust is going up, then that landscape is being eroded. San Francisco is a beautiful city, but it is destined for oblivion. Worldly goods prove fleeting. The surface of the Earth is no place for the artifacts of man in a life after people. Thank you.